Yeah, so uh, I think I will leave the uh, interesting topic to, to Angela, a child who is our guest today, and just say uh, uh, for the start a couple of words about So Angela is a senior researcher in social policy and welfare at the Department of Social Policy and Politics at Johannes Kepler University. It's correct. Uh, she holds a doctoral degree in social sciences and she is also a member of uh, DISTA, which is a Disability Studies Austria, an Austrian network of scholars working according to the principles of disability studies. Uh, in between key areas of her work, uh, there are disability policy, disability research, social policy and welfare, <coughs> public health policy and public health research, quantitative and qualitative methods of social research. She, is, uh, she has been and is recently involved in a number of uh, projects at the Institute for Social and Social Policy in uh, collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with other, uh, different uh, institutions. Like, for example, uh, recently she collaborates with Volker Schenvis from the University of Innsbruck on a study of the history of independent living movement in, uh, in Austria. Uh, maybe she will mention something about that also in her presentation. But the forthcoming uh, is, a, is an article in uh, Disability and uh, Society. Uh, uh, recently she also started to collect life stories uh, through interviewing of persons with disabilities in Upper Austria uh, for Austrian media archive. And I think it's a part, uh, maybe she also uh, explained, but uh, I think this, this work is a part of her work on uh, on a remodeling uh, an exhibition in uh, Schloss Hartheim, which maybe we, we, we had about uh, in, uh, also when we had the presentation about the T4 program in the, in the past. Uh, also, uh, recently, together with uh, Marie René Guevou, uh, she put together two special issues on employment and disability, which uh, were published uh, in, uh, in the European Journal of Disability Studies out there as issue one and four this year. So it's a very decent one. Yes, I think that's, that's, uh, that's for, the, for the short introduction. And uh, I'm going to uh, thank you for coming and for yours. OK, thank you. Well, we're done. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so sorry I can't close from the border, but I don't speak Czech, so <laughs> I'm sorry. But to understand the current disability study, I come to um, I come to study the history of institution and also by the byproduct um, violence. So my presentation today, um, I will use a disability approach, disability history approach. Um, in my presentation, I will um, present the influence of legal and social developments, and foundation of institutional care and education of persons with disabilities in Austria and respective Upper Austria then the structures and framework condition in the facilities, the factors that promoted structural and personal violence, and also the perspective of persons with disabilities themselves. So, I come from Upper Austria. That's one of the nine provincial states, and with one and a half million inhabitants, capital is Linz, and there's two smaller capitals, and small rural. Then, uh, it's today one of the leading industrial regions in Austria, and, and that's important, the help or help or disability policy um, is organized by the lender, also it's provincial uh, responsibility. And that's important. So, but disability history and uh, why, how my work is influenced from this, because disability history aims to establish disability as a category in historical research, such as gender or ethnicity. So, and the aims, of disability history is to a more diverse or complex and also hidden histories of disability that are shaped by equality and um, collective identity formation. So, and that's, I think that's important for my work is that um, uh, this historian Paul Longmore, he's also a disability activist, he says uh, that, uh, or he demands that we should avoid an unreflective perspective of non-disabled people on disability, because then it's mainly a story of treatments or the religions or benefications or neglect. And as a result, disabled people are hidden or depicted as passive and inert. 
and he demands in, instead a constructing and usable past. And that's important that uh, he encourages that historical explanation that can add us um, to understanding our own present and then we can build a future that will be different, more just, better. And that's also, that should be the agenda of scholars who write the histories of currently marginalized groups. So that is how my work is informed. So, but, disability history in Austria. In Austria and also in Germany, Disability in histor historical research is often depicted as self-portrayals of associations running institutions, that's institutional history or welfare state developments, that's the helper's history, then as an individual <coughs> problem or issue of medicine or rehabilitation, that's the bio biologization of social issues, or traditional success stories of medicine, that's the more evilistic narratives, or as a victim of a victim history of Nazi euthanasia or violence. But um, disability history asks for a more socio-economic framing of the history of disabilities and also telling new histories. But what is problematic if you do histor historical research in this field is that the written resources often used uh, are often created for a specific purpose, reflecting the view of the institution or the professional helpers. And they often have a goal, for example in Austria, very often to encourage the general public to donate. And negative aspects, such as violence, are not a barely addressed. But what can help? Help can a critical handling of sources and the discursive construction, interpretation and evaluation, in the analyze of this, and also to ask questions about the models, the power, domination, structures, processes, what encourage stigmatization, exclusion, and so on. So, now we come to Austria, upper Austria. So, as I said, I used the historical um, approach. So, now I explain a little bit the, the historical context and conditions. So, we also had changing affiliations. So, until we were together, until 1918, we were to, uh, together as Kronland of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy. Then by the, so the end of the First World, World War, till 1918, we were, the, we, had the we were a provincial state in the First Austrian Republic. Then part of Hitler's Third Reich. After the Second World War, Upper Austria was again a provincial state in the Second Austrian Republic. Upper Austria was, as I said already, rural and agrarian with some industrial centers, conservative, German national, also very uh, yeah, German oriented, backward. The foundation of the university was in 1966, it was the first university in Upper Austria. It was Catholic with Protestant centers. And if you are malicious, malicious, you can say yes, still some of that is true, but not all, not, it's not anyone like this. <laughs> So, but, so come to disability policy and disability uh, and special schooling. So since the end of the 18th century, maybe it's the same also in the Czech Republic, um, there were some special schools for children with disabilities, but developed on individual humanitarian initiatives, so private associations. And com compulsory schooling of children Categorized, and it's very important, categorized, as if not all were categorized, of being capable to educate it, was established very early, in 1881. And also with the possibility of segregated schooling. So at the beginning was the, segregated, it was the beginning of this legal concept for um, segregating schooling. And then we have the first legal basis a little bit later, but it's the same. And then, when you talk about disability history and also disability politics, it's always, um, you always have the, the development of the social state and the welfare state into mind. We had, maybe also in the Czech Republic, the first expansion of the state control health and accident insurance so by 1888, so around that, which provided um, cover for insured persons on the principle of equivalence in cases of sickness and work accident. And since it was already in the First Republic, so we were divided already, mm -hmm. then since 1921, 
we had a compulsory health insurance for all gainfully employed laborers. And also to a larger the, um, extent to their relatives, also to their children, and also to their um, grandparents, also the dependents, were included but had restricted benefits. But large part of the population, I think only a quarter or 20% of the population was uh, insured, health insured. Um, large part of the population were not insured, like day laborers, self-employed persons, or farmers. The farmers get the um, state-organized uh, uh, health insurance by the 1960s in Austria. So, as I explained, a side note, the first side note, a side note to understand disability policy and disability history in Austria. Um, I want to uh, inform you about the, the Austrian system of social security. So it's a very com comprehensive system um, and very differentiated. So we have this social insurance system based on the principle equivalence, causality, solidarity. We so call it the first social safety net in social policy. So the access is through employment and disability. Disability is covered if it's related to work. So it provides cover for all uh, gainfully employed persons in the case of sickness, work accident, unemployment, per parental leave as birth of a child, and pension. And also to a larger depend, uh, extent to their children. And most of the time, what? And um, it consists of a legal framework for the pension, the health, the work, and the unemployment as well. There are different branches within the social insurance system. And then we have this public welfare benefits available by, at the provincial and municipal level. It is uh, available for citizens in need and for benefits who are not covered by the insurance system. And it comes out of the traditional poor relief scheme. Scheme. So it's, we call it the second social safety net. So it's need tested in case of poverty, for social assistance, in case of kinds, and in cases of disability, it's individual case oriented, with benefits and services for children, youth, and people with disabilities in need of ass assistance. But it's always a little bit need tested because it comes out of, of this traditional poverty relief scheme. And then what's new? In the social system, it's two um, things are the universal social benefits, that's the family allowance and the cash for care benefit. It's for all person that's not need tested, so everyone gets it. If you are in need for, if you have a child or if you are in need for uh, care, because you're old or you need assistance. And then we have the social compensation, um, so victims of it's a victim supply. If you have a disability related, which is related to a crime or army service or a prescribed vaccine, and very new, from 1917, compensation for experienced violence in institutional care. You, get, you can get, as if you are eligible, you can get till 300 euro per month. So, let's jump back to the history. Okay, the monarchy, maybe as you know, had a very rudimentary welfare state. The help and care for the poor, and the, in the Czech Republic it must be the same, I think. It was based on the, uh, it was uh, organized on the basis of the homeland law. It, was a, a, it came into force 1860, uh, uh, 1863. And it was organized according to the subsidiary principle related to the Catholic social decree. It says that I myself, through work, as a self help, through work, or my family is responsible if I'm in need, if I'm poor and I'm in need. And if my family can't help, then I can approach, if I'm a poor person, a very poor person, then I can approach the municipality as the smallest unit in the, the state, the smallest political unit in the state where I have got my homeland right. Um, it, this was into, in force in Austria till 1938. Maybe it was different in the Czech Republic because we had already the first Austrian Republic. So, and this homeland right, that was acquired by birth, marriage, uninterrupted 10-year residence, 
was a uh, was new and for poor the whole municipality had to provide food, clothing, housing, medical care, not to pay for the funeral in the end. <laughs> But the people themselves, the poor people themselves, had no influence on the form of the provision. So it could be very, very basic food, very, very basic clothing, housing, very basic, and medical care was always, yes, you always have to struggle for it. And the basic care system is hardly organized. Medical or vocational care, vocational rehabilitation, or adequate aids like wheelchair and prosthesis. And it was very insufficient, complicated to exercise for the municipalities, very expensive, and the municipalities were mainly poor, especially the rural ones and especially these very small ones. And it was totally outdated in the time of industrialization because people moved from one village to another, but the homeland municipality stayed the one where mainly where you never been, when you never had lived where your father came from for example. So it was very outdated, very complicated, didn't work. And because of this poor relief system was very insufficient, they started a differentiation for children, for the ones who were, yes, who, who were innocent, fought by people, for children, elderly and persons for a disability. And it became a field of the activity of the inner mission and the Christian charity. There was also a boost in the Association Act that uh, it allowed it that the association were uh, funded very easily. And the rudimentary welfare state allowed the dominance of the Christian Welfare Association functioning as private service providers. So now we have a range of, Austria is a small country, we have a range of uh, upper Austrian institutions which are um, we are into the field of taking care of children as well as adults with disabilities. The first we have the public or the state sector, we have the psychiatric clinic uh, in Linz. Then a report informs that out of 1,000 patients, 600 had to diagnose intellectual disability and they were permanently housed in the uh, clinic. And then we have the, a lot of smaller or bigger uh, private institutions like the Catholic School for the Blind with an institution for employment and care for the blind, Catholic School for the Deaf, School for the Deaf, they belong to the church, Catholic Church in Linz, then we have the Protestant Association with smaller institution, then we have this Catholic Association founded a house of mercy for the poor and incurable ill, persons in Linz, and we have the Eidlitz and Fritin institution in Hartheim Castle, then a Krippelheim, Krippelheim home for school children with physical disabilities. There are only some, so we had a lot of some smaller in the regions, associations that were funding um, um, institutions for people with disabilities, different ones. So then we had, uh, because this Krippel uh, institution Triple Home, this, this last institution, they funded a special school and vocational training for those categorized capable to be educated and work. The access was limited because the family had to pay, as the person themselves, when it was a child, the family had to pay or the municipality had to pay. And there was no right that the municipality pays for it. And in this institution, there were reduced quality of education regarding of the teaching content, outdated pedagogical methods, and also the vocational training was not so good. For example, in this uh, workshop, as you can see in the picture, the uh, young man they got no official apprenticeship diploma. So, okay, but it's well, nice tries, first nice tries. But what's um, so the direction and the care in these institutions? The owners were these private organizations with this religious background, and they had all, in all cases, they formed these associations where the members were middle class people, priests, or rural population. And the directors were mainly a priest. As you can see here in the picture, the director of the uh, Anstalt, the Kretin Institute of Hartan Castle, he was also the director of the Institute for the Deaf and Dumb in Linz. And the care were organized by the 
one mainly uh, well, in all cases a uh, congregation of sisters. They can uh, uh, carried out by sisters, some support staff, and by the residents by themselves. And most of the time they had a limited access of special schooling or training, and then they had schools that were in the institutions. So that's the, the institution, it was a very controlled um, institution with not many uh, contacts to the world outside. So, and um, the basic needs of those who were, who were categorized incapable to work in education, to work or to be educated, there were, um, it was okay, but it was not always enough, so it, the food was not always enough, but it was always very clean, clean and warm. And the culture of these institutions were, more or less the culture was, were based on the Christian motivation, very strict rules in daily life, and mainly the strict rules from the congregations, like the sisters were living, and the simulation of a home family. See, the priest as father, they were acting as father, and the sisters were acting as fathers. So it's hardly any, it was also not possible to, to build up a relationship with your family, original family. So, and then the financial funds, and that was then problematic. It was the care allowance from the family or the home municipality, and then the organization where yes, they had its own newspapers, they were selling writings and printed matters, do good and talk about it, because they wanted to have membership fees, donations, collections, or inheritance. So, and also you, you saw the workshop, they were generating some own income, like selling products, here you can see the, the stuff, also the horses, they had, mainly they had big farms uh, belonging to the institutions, and selling the products from the workshops. And also they invested, they had this money from the donations and the collections and the care loans, and they invested in, also in shares in the uh, securities, mortgage bonds, and also in bonds uh, um, to um, finance the First World War. So and then it was critical, because we had, instead of solving the problems of the monarchy, we had this First World War, and it had again great distress by broad sections of the population. And the monarchy, with, his, with the rudimentary welfare state, which was inherited by the First Republic, it was not able for them to fix uh, or to, to, um, to finance the institutions anymore. At first they had these new social accomplishments aimed to secure the working population, like the extension of the social security system and also the eight-hour day and the women's suffrage. But this, this hospital, also the public hospitals, and also these private service providers, they run out of money. So during the war and also in the aftermath. There was a great neglect in the institutions, uh, for, especially for those uh, that were caring for the, those categorized not capable to be educated and rehabilitated. And until, for, as an example, until 1925, uh, a quarter of Residents in the Idiot Institution in Hatham Castle died because of poor food supply and neglect each year. So it was not the same with the, not with the normal population. So what we had then in Austria, we had this propagandistic representation of the reparation, so this honoring of the war invalids and make them rehabilitate them and reintegrate them. Uh, like we had view of this uh, sort of political discussion and also of the political pressure, we had this introduction of rehabilitation, compensation, and employment laws for the war invalids, like this War Invalid Compensation Act and this War Invalid Employment Act. They were very innovative state accomplishments, but they were not as affected as it was needed, and the entitlements and the benefits were reduced in the 1920s. So, people with disabilities were between self-help, like self-help as employed, or between poor house, as you can see here in the picture. And it was a lack of, of public commitment to people with disabilities. It was very visible. So, in the, for example, in the First Republic, uh, when we get the, the Constitution, the state responsibility for the issues of disability was not enshrined. So, no one, no level in the state was responsible for disability. And it was a lack of provision of comprehensive framework of care 
education network. So no one was responsible and everyone was responsible. So. But what we had in the 1920s and 30s, and that's the article that Michael was mentioning, is we had uh, the first Austrian, we had some was something like the first Austrian disability movement. It was a self-help and disability rights movement. And it was influenced by a Czech person. He was very important for this movement. It was Witteslav Braun. He was born in Molnice and died in Auschwitz. He was a Czech, German-speaking Jew, a wheelchair user, and he, um, he, a wheelchair user, and he was in need of assistance uh, since he was 12. Uh, and um, he was moving then during the monarchy to Vienna because he hoped in the capital of the monarchy he will find help. And then he was sent into a poor house. And then he tried to, to get, or he managed to get out of the uh, poor house. And, in the tw and then he would co fund it because he managed to get out of the poor house. And he said that no one should be in a poor house, no one who is young and would like to work should be in a poor house. And so he co funded with um, colleagues, friends, also um, people who have this, had the same mind the first Austrian purple working group in Austria. And he, he and his friends, they advocated for independent living. As you can see here, this was the newspaper. It says, Arbeit nicht Mitleid. It says, work not pity. And their aims were organizing, informing, and empowering people. And it was mainly for persons with physical impairments. And also they created businesses to employ person with uh, physical employment because they said the state will not help you, us, so we have to help ourselves. And uh, that's the, the, the life ended very, uh, yes, and very dramatic. Then he became back to Czechoslovakia in the 1920s and 30s because in Austria with the Austro-Fascist system with the situation, the economic and social situation situation, it came Warsaw. So it, he, he, he returned to Czechoslovakia and then he was living in a, in a Jewish um, home for elderly people in Ostrava when he was sent to Theresienstadt um, in the concentration and ghetto camp because he was Jewish. And in this concentration and ghetto camp, uh, camp we have a diary entries of him found in uh, the archive of uh, Theresienstadt that he organized resistance lectures and also helped other peoples. So he was still resistant. And he was murdered with one of the last transport to Auschwitz in autumn 1966. If you are interested, we are now published uh, his life story in uh, Disability in Society. And I think he got online yesterday. <laughs> very much in time. So, and I am also here, I'm very interested because we also want to do more research on his life because we do not know any, uh, all of his life now. And maybe he was also active in, in, in Prague in, in the Czech Republic. I think it was the first Czech Republic. But. So, but for Austria, Coming back to Austria, new ideas emerged in Austria, maybe also in the Czech Republic, the ideas of eugenics. We had this lecture last year about the Action T4 and the eugenics. So it was the study of how to arrange the reproduction. And it's the method of improving the human race. And also in Austria, these ideas were around academic circles um, through the change of the century. And the, the ideas of combining economics with eugenics emerged also in Austria. For example, an uh, Austrian uh, economics, Rudolf, Rudolf Goldscheid, he propagated the human, econom human economy and the separation of the usable and unusable human material. And as you know, the Nazi adopted this. So we have also in, in Upper Austria, we have this concentration camp. Camp Mauthausen, and we also have this one of the T4 um, killing stations. 
Here you can see the picture of Hartheim Castle with the smoke coming out of the crematorium chimney. Um, but first, the Hartheim uh, welfare laws 1938 replaced the Austrian homeland law. It became better in s for some parts of the population, but for the others, it was uh, yes, it was the, the, the termination. Because for those who got better for the blind, or for those who are um, were categorized capable to be educated and capable to work, they got um, a compulsory care reg regulation through the Nazi welfare laws. They demanded education for the blind, deaf, and cripples, and supported employer ability. But for the others, we had this Gnaden It was a Nazi killing decree signed by Adolf Hitler in the beginning of the Nazi euthanasia, where 18,000 persons with disabilities were killed in, in hard time. And then they killed again 12,000 people in the hard time castle, but there were inmates from the concentration camp Mauthausen who were ill and unable to work. They were murdered in hard time. So Hatan Kaiser, as you see, it's now a, a memorial site and also an exhibition. And it has opened a new exhibition recently, Value of Life, with this, yes, the dealing with the useless. It's very, yes, <laughs> very provoking, pro uh, provocant, provocant. But we have to see. And as you, as you can see, the one in Upper Austria was the one who was in, who was working, I think, the, the longest period. But the, as you know already, the Action T4 was not active in the protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia, but in the German parts, which were annexed to the German Reich. So what we have too in Austria were these decentralized killings the decentralized euthanasia in mainly in psychiatric in the psych, in psychiatric clinics like uh, the psychiatric clinic in Upper Austria in Linz. Here you can see one uh, Aloysia Leitzemiller. She was deaf and had no school education, and she was murdered at the age of 32 in the psychiatric clinic Niederhardt. That's the one in Linz. And uh, the uh, the as uh, the Senior physician and head of the psychiatric clinic in Niedenhardt, Linz, was also the director of the Hartheim Killing Center. So, yes, one person was responsible for both and he was murdering in both institutions. So, after the World War II, it was the reconstruction first of the Austrian Republic. It was the period from 1945 till 1960s. And in international trials, the former Hartheim Killing Center staff was um, convicted because of uh, they were then active, they were first active in Hartheim and then they sent out to the concentration camps, camps mainly in the east and they were killing there and they were convicted for this. And only a few Austrian trials were we had because of murdering in Hartheim and murdering of disabled people and decentralized killing activities. Many perpetrators, medical staff, were not prosecuted. And we still had a doctor who were uh, active in the, in the selection process. He was um, writing, no, he was, he was uh, active in, as doctor till the 90s, I think, the 90s. From Spiegelgrund. Yes, yeah. was the one from Spiegelgrund. Uh -huh. Yes, Gross. So, and then, coming back to the institutions, to the institutions with uh, um, for the institutions for people with disabilities, they returned to business as usual. At the beginning, uh, yes, there was no use to reopen it again, and there were other poor people, so they opened it for um, people, uh, so war invalids or victims from the war, orphans, and then because there were hardly any person with a serious disability left. And there was also a great mistrust of the institutions, institutions and institutional care. But then they started again the segregated schooling because, yes, children were born again. 
segregated schooling or vocational training for those capable to educate or train. And for those who are not capable to be educated, the family or institutional care, the mental hospital, or, as a psychiatric hospital, or the private institutions started again to work with the care principles of warm food and clean. And then again, there came again the, um, the dominance of the confessional oriented institutions. And they had a, they also they had a great influence on politics, media, and society because they were demand, demanding always for um, fundings and also for um, donations. So, two examples. So, how was the history of industrialization since 1945? So, okay, the history again in general, maybe it's also in the Czech Republic, I don't know. The history and the characteristics of institutionalization of adults and children with disabilities is still poorly researched. It has been public, publicly known since the 80s that there is violence and neglect in the institutions. For example, we had, have this Institute Hatan. It's next, it was built next to Hatan Castle because that Hatan Castle was, uh, was not an... It got a museum 2003 and before it was a, uh, um, a house for, for poor people as a social housing with social housing. So the municipality uh, moved uh, poor, poor families in this castle and they lived in this castle um, till uh, the end of the 90s. Then it was renovated and then the museum were put into it. But next to this castle, they built up a new institute. And uh, they, then in the 80s, so in the 80s, they had this radical student criticism not only in Hatam, but Hatam Castle or this Hatam Institute is a very special place. So it's, with this history, it's a special place. And we had this radical students' criticism, which was stopped by the police and also by the legal system. So they had trials and they were, had, uh, yes, they were prosecuted and they had to pay fines because of this. And then more interest we have still the year 2000 because and then recently more interest because of the introduction of this uh, Heimopferrentengesetz in 2017 mm -hmm. because um, the private institution have to pay in a fund where they pay out this um, compensations so they are more interested in now that that there is more research what was what, what were the historical things so, and for example, we did the research commissioned by the Caritas of Austria because they had to pay millions of euros into these funds for the compensation. And um, we did this um, with a research group. Part, the bigger part of the research group, they did this um, uh, qualitative or uh, historical study on <coughs> a Klein, on Klein, which was a home for. Uh, boys without disabilities and I did this for St. Isidore and St. Pius which were homes for children with disabilities but then St. Pius then because the children get older and older what, what to do with the children then for adults with disabilities and I uh, used historical and social research methods and we had this yes, long period from beginning from 1945 or the reopening uh, from St. Pius or St. Pius opening in 1975. And we did the content analysis, analysis and also we did interviews with former resistants, <coughs> former and also um, actual resist, uh, resid residents in the institutions. So the public image was always happy children. Here you can see pictures from the from a calendar, so this they were selling calendars and here you can see yes from St. Eo Pius Institute because they wanted to have donations and also um, convince parents to bring their children so this public image and this public image is, was for the financial funding here you can see um, 160 Children are waiting, we have to build up, so we need donations, we need subsidies to build these institutions. 
And they were writing, this private service provider were writing uh, about this to good and talk about it. So, but they institutionalized children. At the beginning, they were always children. Um, so, disability was always mentioned as an individual or parents or medical problem in Austria. It was not the lack of inclusive educational policy, ambulatory or decentral therapy services or transport, it was not mentioned. It was not, the problem was the individual but not the infrastructure. So, that was in people's mind. So, and at the age of six, um, the children with disability came into these institutions in order to get schooling. Um, and it then, the majority were, this, were low class, had a low class background or came from the rural area. And they're moving because they wanted to have access to school education. Because the normal school, they didn't take, uh, they, had, they were not forced to take children with uh, disabilities, so therefore they had to move in these special institutions. And one third of the children were offic officially ordered education assistance, so they were in care placement um, ordered by the legal system. But two thirds of the children in the institution that were voluntarily brought by the parents. For example, here you see the guiding principles for the establishment of the Institute uh, for St. Peter's Dog. They say, when there are such children in healthy families, it is often necessary to remove them from the family in the interest of the education for the other healthy children. And then becoming a child with learning disability, there was sometimes there was an, either there was this in place, in care placement and there was a new retirement of the children because of this neglect in the family. Or there were these children brought voluntary, mainly with physical disabilities, and then because these special schools in the institution, they were all for children with learning disabilities. So the assignment of a disability along to medical criteria implied special needs education as well, if there were no evidence. So the diagnosis with learning disability they were often added by age as a very senior physician. And they looked for medical tests and they came usually. But okay, how was the education care and rehabilitation in this institution? So for one third it was the possibility of family connection through a caregiver kind of system because there were nuns working in the institutions again, and no labor law is applied for nuns, so they were working in 24 hours. And, or there were two religious women working in these groups, either for boys and girls. So it was very it was strictly segregated. And these institutions, as well as some groups, there, there are other groups, that were self-contained and controlled. And there was, in the institutions, always a shortage of resources and outlets authoritarian pedagogical approach. And there were no public control. The only public control were concerning the financial, financial resources, but not the pedagogical uh, or education. Then it was very hard for the children and also for the parents to, to uh, establish a lasting family relationship because they came there at the age of six and they had one Sunday, was the visiting uh, day. And if you are from the rural area, so most of the time the families had no car, the transport system, the public transport system was not very good in, in Upper Austria. So it was, sometimes it was not possible for them to visit them once a month. So it was very uh, hard to, to establish lasting family relationships because the, the institutions had this restricting family schedule. And the institution were arguing that um, that the children they were yes, they were um, they will have problems in order to fit in the institution so therefore only a few uh, relationship to the family. And in the, the, the education and also the life skills they learned in this institution this was more or less a nice handwriting, handcraft, small manual work but they were little demanded on the labor market and the children in these institutions they were not fit for the life outside the, in outside the institutions. 
and there were uh, excessive use of medical, medical surgery, therapy, or pharmacy in this institution, or the total neglect. So we have two things that uh, for many children accommodated in St. Pius is the home for children with uh, severe disability. There were no medical diagnosis, they, were hardly, they hardly received any therapy or specific medical care because they were categorized not uh, be able to work or be educated. And there was a lack of qualified staff. Or another caregiver from St. Pierre said that I have already experienced that the weaker ones went somewhere else because we could not afford the care. But the better ones, we always kept. They were easier, they adapted, they fitted in, they took over activities in the group home. That was also good for them. But in, re in retrospect, you have to say, we did something to them. So the factors that promoted structural and personal violence in these institutions. Here you can see a nun educated with girls working. So the life until the 1990s. So we have this big change then by the beginning of the 1990s because we have this more professional staff came into these institutions. But till the 1990s, it was a strict gender segregation. It was the simulation of the home families. It was big institutions and big institutions, and the biggest institution uh, had 300 children. Then this, uh, there was a daily life where it was strict. The order and discipline was very important in daily life. Then the places were, uh, uh, were, 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 were closed and also the group, sometimes the group were very close. Religion was very dominant and there were an unprofessional approach because uh, staff were working it was, not, it was not qualified for this work and they had this hierarchical leadership culture. Even if you wanted to change something, even if an educator or a staff wanted to change something, it was not possible. And it had both. No adequate care, support and therapy, or medical, uh, the medical notion was only protect, especially since the 70s. Yeah. So, the second factors that promoted structural and personal violence. So the rules and access to education, as it was one director of, as the director of uh, St. Isidore used to say that you have to discipline the children so that they will turn into something. Then teachers, priests, nuns, and women work, were working there. They were not suitable for pedagogical work. They should have never worked there with children and persons with disabilities, but they were still there. But they were working there. Everyone knows this. Staff were overburdened, so they had too much work. And there were staff also who were thought that the outdated educational methods were right and necessary. That what also promoted uh, violence was that the family of origin or the person uh, they were familiar with, familiar with from outside, it was not sufficiently considered. So there was really this, uh, they were part of Then also there was this focus on donation and charity and this uh, religious religion, very yes, religious, religious instead of professional and modern approach. For example, a caregiver in St. Pius said that the actual violence was much more subtle, subtle than the slap. Violence was being forced to live with people we didn't like or the withdrawal or love from people on you, whom one depended or who were caregivers. The caregivers were only to whom the person had a relationship. Some exercise the power of superiority. So we had all in this institution for children and then later adults with disabilities, we had all kinds of violence. Physical violence, psychological, psychological violence, sexual abuse and assault, different forms of violence among children and persons with disabilities. And they were all the, the cloak of silence and the feeling of powerlessness and no alternatives. For example, uh, a home child said, the children could not defend themselves. If you complained to the parents, the parents talked to the home mother, everything was denied. Or another home child said, she, as so a senior physician, wanted the best for the children. If you don't, if you don't do what I say, she said, as a, she said, if you don't do what I say, I just kick you out. 
then in short, then you don't have therapy, and you go from school blackmail. So, to come to the conclusion, um, there's more interest in violence in institutions for persons with disabilities since the year 2000, and since the year 90s it changed already. It was also, um, we had this special schooling and this inclusive, uh, we had this inclus more inclusive school education offers, special schools with a decentralization strategy, so in every bigger town in Upper Austria you can find a special school, but also for people with disabilities or children with disabilities, it's also, uh, um, they have the right to go into the school next in the, in the neighborhood, and we have also new services of personal assistance since the 1990s. So the number of children with disabilities who are accommodated in institutions declined very in declined in number. But the number of adults with a severe disability who are accommodated in institutions is still stable and also increased. We still have traditional structures dominating and also the preserve of the established system and culture of care. So we still have it because the younger caregivers that were introduced by the older ones, and you always have this tradition. Then, but a part of the persistence of traditional structures um, and also the system in their problems, we have also new services and also new services that would enable more independent living and also the institutions, the they, they, they changed they changed a lot but you can still see some lights of <coughs> So, thank you very much. Thank you. I really admire your structure and your timing. Sarah, <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, so if you want to take charge of the discussion. Yeah, yeah no, I can. No problem. <laughs> Come down. <laughs> but I can be very proud. I Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask you about the key concept you work with, which is disability. You never actually gave us the definition of what counted as disability in your sources. What was defined as disability? And what is the equivalent in the language you use? in the sources from the 19th century and in the modern times, right? Because it changed. And the, the term itself, even in English, it's quite difficult. It's quite modern and what counted a disability historically mm. changed. So I wonder what is the equivalent in your, your sources, the linguistic one, and what actually, you know, how this evolved? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question because it's, it's, the, the category is very fluent. So it's not it's the, the legal system that gives you the, the who is in within a, a social service and who is outside. It's a, the legal definition who decides who is a person with disability, who, can, who is eligible for services and who is outside. And in these institutions, in this um, uh, St. Isidor, children with disabilities, so this, this institution were, all, were only for children with disabilities, but there were a lot of children without disabilities mm -hmm. in these special schools because they thought bringing, or for example, if, if you are in care, so if you are, have uh, this family, uh, if, you, if your children can't stay within this home, within this family of origin, and they had this, yes, they were retarded a little bit because of family neglect, then the um, caregiving system brought these children into this home for children with disabilities because they thought they will get therapy and will get more support than in homes for um, children without having um, a special schooling and without having therapy. So uh, you, they became children with disabilities in former time because they, they, had no, they had no services for it and no, no institutions for it. So the, the category, disability, is very fluent and it's never, it was in former times, if you're eligible for poor relief, so that means you cannot work. They can be old ones, old ones, but very old ones, disabled ones, and children. 
They are one where eligible for poor relief benefits. Then for disability, also for the special schooling, for this so they were eligible for um, children that had problems with hearing, problems with speaking, but today they are not called dis disabled because they get the hearing gear and they get therapy and they can talk. So it's really so we have less today we have less children categorized as disabled children that we had before in the 1960s. Because we now we have more services, more gears, and we don't do not have to put them into institutions with, for children with disabilities. So it's... Okay, so can, can you see any uh, development between, say, 1870s, with the first institutions in Austria, Hungary, and say, 1960s? So what was counted as disability? For example, in the late 19th century, I presume that under that category there were more children who were, say, mentally disabled, so this category of mental disability, learning difficulties, etc. It just entered the category of disability. So is there any development you, you have observed that, you know, that there were different kinds of disabilities which, you know, counted with fall under the rubrics of disability in the late 19th century? And it, change considerably or it change in a specific way throughout the 20th century. It's, you said ve it's, it's very difficult counting your persons with disabilities is always you it's always the, the what is in the moment. So we have for example in the monarchy the the, the K and K statistics was very very good. We know from when they had this when they count the pop they counted the population every ten year in the monarchy, every time you encounter the population, you know, you know, every deaf and blind person living in a village. You you have the, also this very good uh, statistics from the monarchy in the Czech Republic. So they had counted them once. And they know that. But what, it, what was the category then? Was the, it, was, it, was there any like common category, or did they just uh, you know uh, said it as you said it now, like deaf? Uh, Speaking. Yeah. <coughs> Not that they counted like because disability didn't the category disability the, it's a new the invent, yeah, the yeah, word, it's, it's a, a new invention they counted yeah. the blind they counted the crippled mm. they counted the <coughs> insane they counted the, yeah. the, the idiots the idiots you know yeah. yes the idiots but what what says the category today says nothing and they counted also if they say compulsory schooling for everyone was we had this compulsory schooling for everyone, but this one, the Aloysia Leitenmüller, was they, she was only um, deaf, but she never went into school because she was living in a village, and the school was very far away. So she was not the was in school, and nobody cared. Yes, the, the priest came one time and said yes because I talked to her sister. <laughs> She was still living, and they said yes, uh, she could, should go to school. And then they tried it two weeks in school in a public school, but then um, they said no, we cannot, we cannot need you. We, we don't, so you have to stay at home. So the comp compulsory schooling was not so strict. So they said yes, she's not categorized. She's categorized not being capable. But also today, I must say, also today in Austria. There are people categorized as not able to work, living in an institution, going to a workshop of the institution. They had never been categorized with a medical surgery of being disabled by the percent of something. Because they were, yes, because it's, it's like this. Because they went into special schools and then they went into the institutions and they went into the workshops. So it's very difficult when you say, and also the, the figures, they are only, what, what do you count? Do you count if they're eligible for specific services or they, are, they have a, a medical diagnosis that's not always the same? You can also, with Asperger, you can also work as a mathematician in academics. Very <laughs> good. Uh, the, the topic you brought up uh, gave me some um, 
personal recollections of the, the mid 70s when I used to go every summer and sometimes even during the school year for uh, well a treatment in the in the uh, Bart Koenig's part, which is uh, Kinjvart, uh, Kinjvart in West Bohemia. And uh, well, as a as a child, I didn't think about these details mm -hmm. so much. But <clears throat> especially like uh, listening to some of the, the the violence and atrocities that you describe, um, I have to I have to admit that we were, especially in the seventies, uh, we were facing kind of violence too, because we were beaten for our different uh, conduct. And also, uh, there was a, a, a great deal of humiliation as well. As, as a, uh, We were not disabled children. <coughs> we were basically uh, a children with asthmatic and bronchitis yeah, But at this problems. time, you were I was the there, system yeah. of, yeah. The, of, yeah. of disability services. Exactly. Because yeah. they didn't yeah. have something else. Today you were not you were in the medical. Sure, sure. Thing. And so we we uh, we didn't have nuns. Uh, we had the uh, uh, nurses who were most of them were married to a local officers because there would be <laughs> the, 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 the the barracks army barracks near to it. And and everything. If I you know my recollection now is that everything was pretty much uh, military. Mm -hmm. and, and the humiliation I was going to describe was like, uh, I was much younger, uh, but there were kids in almost like early puberty, and they had to stand up in front of other kids, naked, and being uh, uh, treated with, with a balm for eczema problems and so on. But it wasn't done in a private space, it was done in front of everybody. So, you know, for us it was... a. Uh, uh, a standard procedure, but uh, seeing it from nowadays, from the, 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 the current uh, social life, I, I would uh, never let my child be humiliated like that. And also, which, what was really stressing was that some of the, the, the daily chores of, that were supposed to be conducted by the, the nurses were passed on to the, the older kids. So I used to go there uh, until my age of 10, since I was 6 to 10. And when I was uh, 9, uh, me and my uh, roommate, we were uh, sent to clean a, 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 a child who was, who was mentally retarded. And we had to clean him, which was nothing to, to do with, with our uh, duties there, of course. And, we, and the second time when we refused to do that, uh, we were punished. You know, so so there are many things, uh, and and what I can actually feel, I of course there is no, uh, I have no evidence for for any kind of research. But in the 1980s, I still used to go to these institutions in a different town, um, and everything was much more humane there. We even had. Uh, a time for parents once a fortnight, the parents would come and see us. While in Kenigsvart, we were for two months with no contact with your family. Being aged six, it's, it's quite difficult. And, and now I understand that it was also because of the, the complainants that we couldn't complain to our children, uh, sorry, to our parents that we were mistreated. But, and, and again, uh, we, we very well, uh, we, could, we could distinguish the nurses who were friendly and nice to us, and those nurses who punished us uh, in a different ways. So obviously the children tend to stick to these uh, nice parents. <coughs> so it was even a personal uh, thing, but uh, generally the system, uh, the, the, the health system in the, in the socialist Czechoslovakia, um, gave chance to these people who uh, basically abused the children. So, uh, so thank you for the um, for the inspiring uh, talk because uh, it really brought me some uh, some memories which I have. Uh, <laughs> 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 Yeah, but this is how how the and, and also like 
comparing the, the democratic world and the, the, the communist Czechoslovakia, you can see still similar things going on in both countries. Uh, and uh, you mentioned the 1990s as a change. I believe that it was the same in, in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, everywhere basically. In the 1980s, we had the first schools uh, where they um, learned um, how to take care of people with disabilities, how to know the diagnosis, how to, the behavior and everything. So in the 80s, the, the first schools started in, next to Vienna, and so we had no ed educated staff for, for this purpose. So we were not educated staff. And then in the 80s, and then in the 90s, so they had more ones. So they had this, uh, yes, the, the um, um, yeah. It was the educated staff on the one time, and also I think they very much fitted your, your, what you told me, very much fitted to those um, things we heard in the interviews from the children. They had all these punishments, all this, everything was uh, in this group, and the group had everything done, as a, everything they had to do together, and the group punishments also, and then they have to care, take care for um, other yeah. uh, children. And also the violent ones, they were more, mostly the, the ones that were old or overburdened. Also because they were also they were nice ones and, and violent ones. Mm -hmm. But the violent ones they were mostly in the very dominant position. Because in there was in Austria they were always very religious too. They had a very good yes, relationship to the director. So if you are if you were religious then you had a good relationship to the director who were a priest. So it's and maybe it's more military, you say it's more military, but it's the, the culture of living, because there were nuns, and nuns were, had a leading role in these institutions, and they were living according to their congregation rules. And these congregation rules, being silent, being disciplined, strict rules, they applied in the institution for all, and also for this, for this supporting staff, which were at the beginning non-educated women from the neighborhood, but then more and more young young women because they were cheap young women and then they said what are you doing so I because they always tried to to um, control the private life also of the young women so they had to be at home at eight o'clock in the evening uh, they were not allowed to go out so it's really so they were controlling everything in these institutions and so mm -hmm. and then <laughs> in the eighties then in the nineties we had this the radical student criticism. Because, yes, it was criticizing it very heavily. I was, uh, a couple of times I was punished for inappropriate talking. That would be something for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to think that. You were talking about your parents. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it wasn't necessarily like beating. Sometimes it was, but sometimes we were just. We were forced to stand with, with our hands uh, uh, stretched with, with a ruler on top. And I do remember how, you know, how I thought, well, it's not a punishment, I can manage. But after <laughs> half an hour, you are just suffering, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, as well, we, like, we were there to, um, to manage our health condition. But the stress we, were, we had there was uh, contraproductive, definitely, you know. Obviously, we had some benefit from the, the good air, from, from mineral water, from walks and exercises, <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> less stressed and yeah. happy, really, really desperate. And, and you practiced pretending not having asthma <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big. <laughs> I was thinking of that a lot because I think that the world inside the institutions and the world, the development outside the institutions, the, 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 I think about the gap uh, become bigger and bigger because inside the institution was this religious, and this, but outside in the eighties and so there all this violence uh, come. So the, the children changed. So they were talking, they were asking, they were, and but also they, they, they had demands, and it was not right for those children to demand something because they are here uh, because of their poverty or the. Yeah, yeah. The, the illnesses and the, they get something. And there was no way out of it. So, Radan and then Rishka. You, thank you for your talk. You uh, criticized on many of levels that lack of, of medical care. Yeah. 
But if you look uh, to the history of medical care, uh, it's very, very same uh, a picture. Yeah? It's also a, a combination of uh, so-called scientific views and uh, goodwill with total neglection and ignorance and sometimes even structural uh, and personal violence. If you uh, look, for example, um, till 1990s when uh, the uh, child is born, uh, it's taken from uh, uh, his mother uh, aside and uh, um, to a proper room, and there is a hundred of uh, yeah, yeah, children of the same age, and my mother's are alone, and uh, just uh, they got the uh, child just 25 minutes to breastfeed, and uh, the child is returned back. Yeah. Uh, there is uh, that, that picture um, um, Jan show us uh, here is um, from medical institution, in fact. Yeah. So uh, you can you can see that this kind of mistreatment on the. Uh, many of the levels, and I have a question about your methodological or even personal approach, because I, I miss that, this is a very moving story, and I think you are probably 100% uh, right, but I, 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 I miss that looking for a goodwill, yeah, there must be some goodwill of those institutions or of those, person, uh, of those uh, people who uh, did the care uh, th th themselves? Yeah? Uh, uh, was you looking for, for it, uh, uh, frankly, or not? Yeah? So uh, I, I missed that some some so second part of the uh, of, of, of the story. Uh, uh, um, my 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 grandmother uh, she got uh, education in a um, monastery uh, institution, which was very very hard. But uh, she got very bad uh, grades there. But, but all her life, she uh, enjoyed the knowledge, for, for, and she, she uh, knew how to play piano. She knew not only education, higher mathematics uh, from it, and just for three years institute. Yeah, so uh, she, she knew all the plants around there. Yeah. So uh, she, she, she came from a very rural uh, neighborhood. Uh, uh, for three years to a monastery to Olomouc, and uh, uh, since the, uh, her death, she was a kind of a, almost a top intellectual. <laughs> yeah, she, uh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 there must be something uh, good on it. Yeah? So, uh, uh, I, I think you, you neglect also a kind of, uh, uh, <laughs> of the, 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 the story. But, I don't know. That's right, that's right, perfectly right. Um, uh, I was asked to uh, present the violence or focus on the violence. But, but, but you have chosen the violence. No, you're yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, 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 I've chosen, but um, I can I also bring it. It's, it's the victim history. It's yeah. a victim. It's, yeah. That's a classical presentation of the victim's history. Yeah. And there were a lot of children who got the school education there and got, uh, yes, learned how to play. Uh, um, uh, instrument and also, but a lot of, but that's, that was not the focus of my presentation. So it's it's that was it would be the institutional, the, the helpers history. Yeah, but there must be the, many of the us. Manifest manifest of, state history. Yeah. Yes, yeah, there, there must be also a history of of, of the struggles to uh, change it. Yeah, so uh, or they didn't yeah, change it. It's a good question. How the criticism yeah, was? Uh, criticism. Uh, you know, how how did it sound in your interviews? Like uh, what your uh, communication partner said about it. You said that you made like. I did the interviews. interviews. Yes, I did the interviews, and but this was a study um, studying violence in the institution. Yeah. So it was a um, study on behalf of the Caritas, uh, which violence they had in the institution. So I looked at the violence. Yes, I did not look at the. What, the, what was the success and the services and what it brought to the yeah. children with disabilities. No, my focus was violence. Yeah, but, but, because but, there are a lot of research done, <laughs> but the institutions did good to the children. So <laughs> there are a lot of reports and success stories and everything. Yes, I looked at violence. Yeah, but, but the history of such institutions is uh, full of the stories when the new director comes and uh, try to change something and uh, didn't change anything, obviously. But, but uh, that there is also that goodwill to report it. That yeah, that I miss that. Uh, no, there was always a goodwill. Yeah. In, in front of it, it was always a goodwill. But yeah. then behind it, it was all violence too. So it was hidden because of the proposed of these institutions. What? 
was bring us our, your children. We are the experts. Don't uh, we bring it to us and don't because of because we had these institutions with the special schooling. We had a very long time. We did not have inclusive schooling because they were very these institutions. They were very influenced. They influenced the, the policies that give us the money instead of financing inclusive education. Because at the beginning of the new, uh, at the, re, uh, uh, the reconstruction of the um, Second Austrian uh, Republic in Upper Austria, the policy was um, inclusive education. Because we had hardly any person or uh, children with disabilities who was in need for special schooling left. So it's yes, it would it's so therefore try everything that the children can go to the school next to this. But then they started again these institutions because they had it before and they wanted to re um, uh, introduce them again and then they said no federal uh, uh, no responsible in the, in the policy, give us the money, it's cheaper when we have, for those little number of children, it's cheaper when we have a centralized place, a centralized institution, where we have all the services, also the, the therapy and uh, medical care services, and the children are, are brought to us, it's cheaper when we have the system mainstreaming, uh, so school, uh, special schooling mainstreaming in, uh, in this country. And then they did it like this. So it, there were, also it's the fault of the institutions that we had not the decentralized services for children and adults with disabilities because we had this uh, centralized institutions. Which is kind of a violent goodwill. Yeah. It's a violent goodwill, yes, because in the beginning it was different. And they are influenced very much. And then also the director, one of the director, please, he said, he was written, that in Upper Austria, the, the government, it's the cheap, the, the children with disabilities are educated and terrible. It's the cheapest money, money than in all other federal states in Upper Austria. Because we are so able to, to, uh, to organize money from collection and inheritance. And also, the, 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 it's so cheap in, in our institution for the children because we have these nuns. And with the nuns, the, they are really, they, they were working till the age of 80 or not, they had a lot of children to, to take care of, working five, 25 hours a day. They were really exploited. The cheaper the better. The cheaper the better. That was the, the cheaper the better. And also you said to me this with the neglect of medical care. And the, they were both. Neglect of medical care and aggressive use of medical care. They were both. They were medical care pharmacy were used a lot of for those children but who were... Because medical care is a problematic itself, yeah? It, it brings the, the problem, the very same problem itself. Yeah. But they were both. But the children were treated differently according to... Uh, they were categorized being capable to work or educated or being not capable to work and educated. So aggressive use of medicine care and therapy, therapy, but those who believe that they are able to be educated and able to be um, work later on, and neglect, total neglect and no therapy for those yes, who were categorized that they could work. Categorized. It's not Okay. So I saw Alishka and uh, I said in the if it was also sometimes it was um, it came in which institutions you were in, in those for the severe children for the, with the severe disability or children for those who are came, came able to categorize to educate or uh, be educated to be able to be educated it was like sometimes yes Hassad it was sometimes like I don't know if there were a place free unfortunately it was something this. It was not. They, they thought that everything could organize, so, but it was not. It was something that was very a mess. As they say, we kept, we kept those who were capable to, to get a better education, but they were easier. And those who were um, difficult to take care of, we sent them away in the institutions, and that's more worse. 
So uh, I believe that um, the institutionalizations of the care and so the medicalization of it is itself problematic, or at least ambivalent. I, I can see that. But my question may be a bit uh, controversial one, is whether, based on your research, you can see uh, some essential relation between the fact that these institutions were religious institutions and the level of violence observed. Mm. You have you, you yes. my question, to put it very openly, whether there's some really essential relationship between the fact that it's these uh, nuns and so on were uh, Christians mm -hmm. and the level of the violence observed in these institutions. The byproduct of institutionalization is always violence. It's always a byproduct. Even if it's a religious service provider or it's a non religious service provider. I think I got an email today that they will um, present a, a, research, a, 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 a research project on um, homes for children from Volkshilfe, that's a social democratic service provider in, in Vienna. And it, there were also cases of violence. Because I think institutionalization always has a byproduct of yeah, violence, yeah, yeah, but you have yeah, to take care that, of this. Yeah. You only have to take care of this. And in, in, in this private in, institutions, it was, for them, it was, the first priority was um, being cheap, not avoid violence. Mm. And today it's more or less avoid violence. So it's not being cheap anymore. It's, it's very, as a, I think from the um, social budget from Upper Austria, Two-thirds of the social budget goes into services for people with disabilities and uh, mentally ill persons. Because, of, but because it's a provincial state responsibility, I have to say. But it's a big part. And maybe because also of the history in Upper Austria, it's uh, violence is always when there is artists. Today you can't, um, you can't be silenced when, when you know violence. So they have... They, they, they learned a lot of because we have this hard time. Then we had this uh, also the scandals in the 90s and 80s, and so it's improved much. But from institutionalization, always violence is a bad product. Yeah, that's that's true. I I didn't want to no. ask this, but um, but there are specific ca characteristics because of the, with the nuns. Yeah. With that the trees, that's what I would religion. say, that there yeah. are some differences and maybe it's even, to put it very schematically, my idea would be that it's even worse <laughs> when it has yeah. the religious frame. <laughs> but it was a question, I, I'm not saying that... Because Jesus so. forgives everything. Yeah. 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 Not yeah. always and not with all nuns. Yes, yeah. 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 yeah, of course, maybe of course. Again, if we ask about uh. the interviews, did you interview nuns as well? Yes, as well. And priests, and how did they reflect on the, on the violence? Okay. I interviewed one, I tried to interview one who was accused of being violent and she did not talk to me. But I only interviewed those nuns who are now one okay okay, one nun who was ninety-five? No. Mm -hmm. Who was accused to be violent, but or very conservative, but if a person with 95. It's yeah, of course. But I interviewed a, a nun who was uh, a nice one, and uh, she was very, mm, very good prepared. She had the list of all her children here. She see, at least I had 30 children during my lifetime here, and I have, some I have still in relationship, and some sent me money because of things and so. And she, yes. She, she told me, yes, there were violence, and because the, the, the nun with the family next to her, she was very violent. And there were violence, but I was, not in the, I was not able to say something, and I could not help the children, so I shut the door that I could not hear it. So yes, because it was a dominance, this conservative, and this, they were the more dominant ones, the religious ones were the, 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 ones with the better relationship to the priest who was the director. And um, yes, they had one, uh, they, they had one 
priest, a, a monk, who was with its sexual abuse, sexual abuse. They told me the story how it was. I heard different ones, so I can maybe I can tell it how it was. It was the one who was disabled by himself, also in this in these institutions. They were not. They, they didn't send the the good stuff from the congregation. They were the stuff. Yeah. The, the, I used to call it B stuff, <laughs> not the A stuff, oh, because the A stuff was in the yes, was in the church or was in the hospital, but also within the sisters and the priests they were the B stuff, also not the, this, the stuff we cannot use. We use it for the disabled. <coughs> but they were sent there as a, as a form of punishment. Yeah, yeah, punishment or the old one or the, those who are not so capable to work in <laughs> the hospital or so. So and they had this uh, monk. monk uh, ma, this monk, and he was he, well, he was not fit for life by himself, and so he gave money to the children, and the children sat in, sat in his room, and they were yes, he were to, talking to them, do you touch yourself? Show me how you touch yourself. Can I touch you? And so and they gave, he gave money to the children and the children came, the boys came because they got money and then they hide all the stuff and so and then it was, yes, they, they got to know it because the children had stuff, they had money but didn't know where they came from and they know it, uh, but they did not, so it was never, it was never scrutinized, it was never analyzed officially, so because they sent him away and that was it. But Yes, it was how the, how the church dealt with things like that. And I know uh, a nun, she was responsible for young women in Hartheim Institute. She was 80, as a one small one, this one. She was beating the, 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 the young women with, with stick, with everything she found. Because there were, yes, she was, she had not any, she was not, Capable anymore. She was overburdened. And she didn't understand eight year old nun should not take care of twenty year old <laughs> women. They have other interests. They are other socialists. So there's more or less the big big gap between them. The gap between them. Sometimes the nuns say that they did it because they uh, especially when they cared for uh, uh, adult uh, male that they, they did it because they protected themselves. That means you put together, you know, 60, 70 people that they, they sometimes use this violence. Yes. The, the way they describe yeah. it as a kind of uh, protection. Of yes, them. I have this too, yes, they protected themselves. Okay. It's just a horrible place. Yes, yes because they were not educated how to approach someone who is violent, aggressive. They were disturbing the, 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 the interface. Or has sexual mm -hmm. needs which they are deprived yes. of because they live in institutions and then there's women taking care of. No, there are always a very aggressive culture in this group. Mm -hmm. Among the disabled people and between the carers too. Yeah. It's probably also important to say that up until the 20th century, all the asylums, all the institutes were run exclusively by religious orders. And it was in context of those orders that what we could define as modern approaches to disability were actually defined, were coined. It was in the context of religious orders when sign language was the role in interaction with you know those children, etc., etc., etc. So I wouldn't you know demonize the church mm -hmm. in this respect or not that much. It's probably you know just the nature of institutional care that these things happen, yeah. these you know, yeah. negative yeah. things. But yeah. I would be careful not to demonize. A religion in this in this respect because it, historically it was a religious yeah, context yeah. where you know the modern approach to this and it is where some other things. No, I'm not saying that it is so. <laughs> <laughs> One of the main problems is that it was never talked about violence. It was never talked about violence. So when I talked to maybe I can remember I talked to one former um, child. He was um, he was. He, 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 he said things that couldn't be true about sexual abuse and everything, but because of never, it was never talked to him what happens, so
So in it, when it came older and older and older, all the stories that they, they were, they, they came, so they mixed also their history and what they heard about these institutions. And that's also, that's a, that comes up very often. That they mix what they heard about violence in the student institution and that they mix it with their own histories. And always, and what they always tell me that even if they, ha they have suffered from violence in their home family, in their, in their family from original family, it was never their original family, never their own mother. It was always the caregiver who mistreated them. And that's also, I think that's because it was never, so they were traumatized children and it was not, it was not talked about them, about their traumatization and their, what they experienced. And therefore they mix everything. I, I was thinking about that religious, especially Catholic concept of suffering, because it's one of the central concepts that we in our life have to suffer and also some uh, people have to su suffer, it's a kind of the um, way of life, yeah. <laughs> and if you uh, uh, yourself <laughs> suffer, it's uh, okay, it's your choice, but if you want to from, uh, for, for, from uh, your patient to suffer, <laughs> it's, uh, it could be a very close way uh, coming to violence, or uh, that kind of structural violence. Uh, but the suffering is more applied on the stuff. Yeah. And the nuns and the staff, yeah, they yeah. were suffering a lot. Yeah. They were suffering because su the, the, con the Catholic concept between the su behind the suffering is to be close to Jesus and God. Mm. As a, to suffer like Jesus suffered mm. <laughs> in, in work, in the work, in, in the overburdened work, in uh, when you are having exhausted work, in, in working 24 hours till you are eight. So it's like Working for children with disabilities, they call it gold grabbing. So they grab yeah. gold in order to, to be closer to to have a better place in heaven. <laughs> I, I don't know it. But I, I, I read it in the, this grabbing gold, I read it in a chronicle of the, the Sisters of Mercies. That is the place, this, this Hartheim Castle, when it was an institution for the idiots. That is the place where I can grab my gold for heaven. Mm. And I have to work hard, and I have to suffer, and I, it's like colonization of the persons with disabilities because they're, that's, that's the, the, they're the object that help me to be closer to God. They have to work hard too, because yeah, yes. to and so wake up at five and go to the... Yes, uh, and they were working very, very, very hard. We still have a question from Petra Zedin and Marek, and then, then the others. Thank you very much for your uh, rich historical approach uh, in describing or analyzing the landscape of care, and also state of care, perhaps. And I'm, I'm coming from uh, primal religious studies or education care and anthropology myself. So I'm just wondering uh, what we know from the Austrian uh, situation in elder care, especially related to mobility of care. Um, as your colleague Brigitte Allenbacher, she's explaining that there is a really uh, hard stigma or negative stigma on institutional care uh, for elderly also in Austria, not just for uh, disabled people. And that there is another approach, of course, glorified by state institutions, aging in place, connected to living care, provided by mostly migrant care workers from Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, including Czech care workers, mm -hmm. I'm studying them, <laughs> uh, but in Lower Austria, not in Upper Austria. So I'm just wondering, uh, we already know that this living care is precarious, it's, it's really crea uh, creating uh, precarious working conditions, but also those care workers are um, limited from uh, Austrian uh, welfare system, even in case they are uh, EU care workers as Czech care workers. So, what I learned from your story is that institutional care is bad care, but what I know from my story, living care is a bad care as well, mm -hmm. especially for care workers. So I'm just wondering uh, what we can learn for the future from, from your story and my story. Are there some alternatives uh, in terms of care for elder, elder people and disabled people? I'm thinking about some forms of uh, community care or so I'm just wondering, are there some um, new alternatives of care 
raising in Upper Austria in terms of uh, disabled people or elderly care people, uh, elderly people. Mm -hmm. Care for elderly people, care for children, and care for persons with disabilities originate from poor relief benefits, from this poor relief scheme system. Mm -hmm. So it's the person then himself, herself, or the family, and only if you're poor, then it's the municipality, then it's institutional mm -hmm. care, then it's then it's then you are and that's that's the poor house. The poor houses they were the care houses for the elderly originally. So I don't have a photo but you, you can see poor houses then you see a lot of old people they cannot work anymore and they are poor but then they have no relatives that they can work with, uh, live with. Therefore you are in the poor house. And then you have to see some younger ones and they are always people with disabilities. And that's that's the mistrust also that's why it's not very um, that's it's, it's not very it's not very um, you don't want to go into institutional care because it's always related with the poor house. Still, but they cannot mention it anymore. So they don't remember it anymore, but they have this feeling of something bad. And then you have this mistrust because of the uh, euthanasia, because they also <laughs> Um, uh, killed all people from the poor houses. So some poor houses that they, they brought some ten people from the poor house into uh, Hatta and killed them in Austria. But so also you have, uh, uh, but the alternative, yeah. the alternative, alternative is put more money into the system yeah. and pay Austrian caregivers to take care of okay. them. Okay. Yeah, but uh, I have an argument here. Yeah. And, and, and it's by the normal labor law, because yeah, it's sure. not the normal labor law applied. It's like a slave system, sure. a domestic system. No. Sure, but uh, another argument could be here that you know this cash for care system, which also is applied for elderly, but also for disabled people, is uh, leading to tailorization of care and then therefore commodification, privatization, financialization. Yes. We know Senecura and all those corporates, uh, corporate firms coming into the um, to our region, let's say, generally. So I'm just wondering, and we know from Karol Polani, uh, economic anthropologist, that com care is not commodity, it's a fictive commodity, it's difficult to commodify this. So I'm just wondering if you put more money than some private firms are taking them and do you think this yeah. is a solution? Is it so easily we can commodify care and it means that we don't have, at the end, great quality of care? You know, um, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what we know already from elderly care research. Yes, you can have this state-organized care, like you have it in the institutional care, or in Austria you have this care services where you can get the money and you pay, and you pay uh, for care services. So this cash for care, also kinds of cash for care, then um, it was a decision. So people with disability was very much involved in, to, in introducing this Pflegegeld, this cash for care system in Austria. Because we had this cash for care system for the war invalids. And they said, people with disability said, I, uh, it's not my fault that I'm living with a disability. I want to have the same cash for care system like the war invalids had. Have. So they enlarged the system and made it general. And that was also the, the that was also the decision to marketize it because yeah. they say you get you get the money, but you can now it's also in, in, in the element of independent living because you are independent and you can pay whomever you want. Who would sh should do the care? So it's mainly care, care, care service provider, care yeah. service provider. But you can also pay care service providers, which employ, employ people who are doing professional care. Or you can have your wife, your mother, and your things, or your daughter, who is doing the care. Because it was a decision. It was it was the demand that you have the last because you have it in these categories. It, it, is, it depends on the amount of support you need. If you need a small support of amount, you get 200 euro. If you have a, a bigger amount of, of, of care, you get, I think, in Austria, uh, 1,600 a month. But then it's closed. So if you, need, if you are in need for 24-hour support, 
you don't have enough money to pay this. So, if you have this open category, there are not many people who need 24 hours. Uh, but you know, the 24 hour system is precarious from. No, I, I don't say 24 hour system, but 24, 24 hour. You can't 24 hours. Yeah. Yeah. 24 okay. hour. Yeah, but how is it designed now? Yes. It's it was in Austria, but it was the decision of. It was mainly. It was mainly the demand of the well of middle class. Because you have to have an apartment or a house, you have to have a room, and you pay you have to pay something to it uh, for it. And it is was the demand of the middle class to to stay into the house and to have an independent living. But yes, with all these by things of having a domestic system as you can also say the slave system, but it, when you said if the working condition improve in countries like at the moment Romania or Bulgaria or Slovakia, then nobody will come to Austria to work for this shitty money and also to this shitty working conditions. Yeah. So let's hope that the things got better in these countries and that we are in need to reform the system. Because they wanted, they, they had to, they could have made it, make it better, yes, that's right. But they don't want to make, to give money into um, care. That's, that's all. I know it's a shitty system. And it's an uh, explosion of, uh, explo maybe they exploit women from other countries. Yes, that's right. In order to have independent living. Yes. Something yeah. like is happening in the field of disability is so heavenly as in elder. Not perhaps. Or it's been like the community forums. Yeah. 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 Things yeah. like that. If there are any very recent developments, perhaps. Um, we have now 24 hour care for people with disability. We don't have this. We only have this for elderly person. We have this for persons with disability. Yeah, I know someone who has it, but it's not common. When you are in need for 24 hours care, and it's mainly the relatives, so you are a younger child, and when you get older, it's institutional care. Still, it's institutional care. So, no magic word is always very complex. No magic. It's not no word at all. <laughs> Which will fix it all. And we have personal assistance services. But you don't, uh, you, it's, uh, you don't get it 24 hours a day, so. But I know one who has it for 24 hours a day, but you have to be very rich. Because yeah, they have a good yeah. pension. I can see some advertisements mm -hmm. uh, on Facebook of care workers from Children's Family in Slovakia, where uh, some Austrian families are asking for someone who is not having autism or something like this for uh, 24 hours. Yes, I know, I do really, yes. But I'm but not sure how is it legal or... Kind of shadow, uh, in shadow system of um, formalization of this kind of service. But there are some advertisements like that. Yes, you have to have the, the housing, you have to have the money, and you have, yes, you want to have, it's like au pair girls having it for, yes. What is the difference to au pair girls? Okay, sure, sure. <laughs> Okay, then we have Marek and then Petra. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is very similar to the previous one. So, um, if I want to improve the system to prevent the violence, what should I do? From what I understood is I should pay more to the employees so that I attract more competent people. I should perhaps have more competition that's related to decentralization. Is there anything else? Like, could you summarize? Like, if I were to design the system, how to do that? to prevent violence. And my second question is related to our understanding of violence, because um, I think in the past, everything was more violent, like schools were more, more violent, families were more violent, hospitals. So I think a good benchmark would be like in 1920, like if you compare the institution with orphanages, schools, hospitals, like was it much worse than okay. uh, elsewhere? Like, a slap to a certain time was a normal thing in education. So it was not this slap, the single slap or so. so. But it was like, you told it very much, it was like not normal behavior in education. 
what was not normal. It was not normal that everyone is naked. It was not normal to have group punishments. This was ne ne so violence that was never be normal. So like not the slap, not the punishment for something you did wrong or something, but not normal and permanently violent. So that's that's my that was my form of because what this was is not never the single slap, never the single punishment. Yeah, I understand it, but uh, but I, I think also at schools it was really bad, right? Like there was like beating with children and so on, and uh, so so I'm not trying to like downplay the, uh, the violence. I'm I'm just uh, yes, I know, like, I know, I know. Yeah. But the, the institutions were always violent. Oh, there was violence. Uh, yeah. uh, mm. Yes, it was violence. But I, therefore, I. I have this, this slap, this form of violence, like, yes, beating, kicks, corporal punishments, yes, physical violence. So I did not count, I did not, I, it's not, I did not count it, and I, I only mentioned it, what happened in this institution. So psychological violence, locking a child away, it was not locking a child away for one hour, it was locking a child away for a whole day in the cellar. It was never normal, locking a child away even not in the 20s, for one day. Um, grabbing, washing, yes, this washing. It was not normal to wash a 14, 15 year old boy with the hand of someone. So uh, uh, this kind of, even if you are, if you are, if it's possible for a person to wash yourself, so, but because it's, it's quicker when the nun washes everyone with the same, uh, uh, it was never normal <laughs> to be washed in the same bath tube, mm -hmm. only when you are belonging to the same family, maybe. But not for those, for ten <laughs> children. It's not normal. So that's what was not normal. So I'm not and sure whether this is really a historical argument, right? Because yeah. what counts as normal that really changed so much over the last hundred of years. And violence is a wonderful example of that, right? Maybe some of the things were relatively normal in the mid 19th century in certain institutions. So I guess in the institution it was yeah. normal. But that is I compare no, it with, 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 yes. with what's outside. Yeah but that is that, that was the question, right? If you compare different kinds of institutions from the same time period, which is the key, you know, mm -hmm. to the historical approach, what uh, results would you get? You know, historically, if you just compare violence in asylums and in those homes for disabled people institutions or to degree of violence in other similar educational institutions you know that, that was the question right what would you get was it very different you know in these type of institutions or was it rather that institutional violence was relatively common up until a certain point I cannot say I did not compare with it you cannot say that's no. true you cannot, I cannot say it, no. <coughs> I mean, it's important how we conceptualize uh, the violence because I think it's, a, it's a the most important term and, uh, and uh, I, I feel it's a real broad term. I, 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 ah, okay. If you can clarify. I, I qualified it by Johan Galton. He said it's structural and, and personal violence. Personal violence is from person to person and structural violence. And a lot of those things I brought here is structural violence. Um, and personal violence is, yes, being aggressive from one person to another, and that can change over time, but it's, it was never normal that, that you get constantly beaten. It was not normal by a caregiver in an institutional care. And also that says, and that's also not my, um, I'm not doing evaluating this, because we have this Heimopferentengesetz. And uh, um, people get this um, get this pension, 300 euro per month, if they can say that they uh, experienced violence in the institutions. And so, and there is the, the commission who is um, 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 evaluating. Uh, yes, evaluating that what was violence. So it's not me. So. So only I'm doing only the research. So therefore, I did not I did not count, and I did not compare. I only said that the violence, and I only described which kind of violence. What did they tell me? What can I see from the from the records, from the archive? But that is the point. It is violence defined according to the current criteria. 
it is not sensitive to all the fact that um, uh, educating and raising uh, uh, children in families, not only in institutions, were much more violent than we are accustomed today. And especially when the child was disobedient, when it was a difficult uh, object of, of education, we could say that it was very common that such a child was beaten almost all the time. As you say, although I, 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 have, I have doubts that, that you really can mean it seriously that it was constant beating all the time and so on, so on, and so on. I mean, the, 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 the original narrative was not that it was constant beating all the time and so on. Similar people were beaten very often that time even outside the walls of these institutions. Uh, you started and you developed your narrative uh, with, with the pre presumption that, that uh, it was almost only in these institutions when, when this violence was uh, taking place. It, for me, it is not convincing and, and it is, I would say, politically For me, it, 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 it is betraying the political message of such a presentation. It, it's not good that we are talking about it today. About what? About, what? about the, this, this subject. I mean, uh, it, it seems to me politically dangerous to, to grasp the problematic in such a way. But you brought this example with the obedient child. And it's normal See? to be beat. obedient child, obedient. Yes, because of institutional care, this child, it was better for a professional caregiver, ask why you are obedient, why you are not, uh, why you have to behave like this. They did not ask, so in, in their very family, I uh, think, she was slapping the children all the time and did not ask because they were traumatized children, some of them. Some of ch the children were with a specific uh, things they were struggling all the time. So I'm not she's trying to, so, to no, defend no, no, no. these I, activities. I, I, I'm just okay. saying I that, for instance, even in this story about uh, uh, Maybe the, the, young, the young man uh, being naked yeah. in front of, of a physician, I mean, uh, Yenda himself mentioned that the reason, which we might accept today or not, that the reason was medical to, 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 to proceed with a check of of this, the, the health, healthiness of the skin, so to speak. And uh, I remember that uh, 30 years ago, even after 1989, early 90s, it was quite usual in waiting room in, in, uh, in front of the physician's office that the physician uh, treated me without any respect toward um, intimacy of, of my health uh, information, for instance, while it only seldom happens today. Uh, the only thing we are saying is that we are talking about the shifting terrain. Uh, we are talking about something without proper respect toward the broader context. With that, toward historicity of what we are talking about. Although uh, you uh, take a, a position of a historical research, but uh, I'm not sure that you really have respect for the historicity of, you are talk of, of what you are talking about. Why would you say there is no respect for the history? No, can, can I, can I say, it, like, I, like I think there is a, mis a misunderstanding, Sorry. like you had it before, I, I only, well, you did not say uh, first. It, it, you no, only I said, admitted, I said, you, you I said, no, 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 I said it. After my colleague's uh, question. You, you, you did not I said it at the beginning, institutions for persons with disabilities, and then I said also, which, and I do, it's victims, victims' history. You can have it as a self portrayal you can have it as individual problem of medicine. But I can take, talk about everything very long, but I have and I wanted to go in depth in this part of the coin. I do not want you to talk about everything. That was not my point. 
You want her to say I that she's not talking about her. Can you please tell us about the base comparison? Because you, what? On what you base your comparison? Because uh, we were talking about about the historical approach, which needs to compare situation in different circumstances in one approach. And you are making a comparison between your family approach, maybe, and the institutionalized approach, saying that it was very much the same in both. No, no. My, no let, me, let me finish, please. My question is: On what you base your uh, uh, you know, based, uh, what you are saying about families. How do you know on, on, on well, what research you base your... The presenter started with saying that what we know about institutions for disabled people is uh, somehow shifted by the fact that the official materials were uh, released for the purpose of raising money and things like that so that we do not know much about what really happened in these institutions. Sorry, but in books, in literature, in movies, uh, uh, not in one, but in many, uh, you cannot be surprised by the, by the situation we were presented today. You cannot. In institution, uh, but I, I, I really doubt that you know, what Angal is saying is the situation in the institutions was, was by no means normal in an outside world. So you would have to really question this statement, right? You would have to say that what she is describing yes. was happening at the specific epoch in the fantasy, let's say in the same, you know, that's the same what I, That's what I guess. That's I'm what, not you, that's what, what you are saying, but you are basing it on a couple of your personal on the, on experiences. The, on the same, on the same source. Years years ago, I, and that's not enough. My sorry. bases are the that's same sources enough, as, as sources that helped me not to be surprised by, by the things we, we, we heard before. Yes. You are questioning uh, literature research on a, basic, on a basis of a couple of personal experiences. That's, that's not a uh, serious... No, I, I, I'm not claiming that it was that way or the, that way. That's exactly I, I mobilized my personal experience as far as I could. For instance, when I was commenting this, this example of, of naked persons and how, 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 how physicians tr treat us well, with uh, in addition to our decency and so and so on, I am just raising my strong doubts about the strategy and the the, the, the form of the pre of, of the presentation, which seems to me, in comparison also with my uh, other work as a social social scientist in, in other contexts, I just feel that this is not quite historically sensitive and it is somehow strange that uh, for instance for me it was a explanation anyway that that I was asked to, to focus on violence so I was talking about violence I mean it's not if you said in the beginning I was asked to talk about violence and without to broader context so I will tell you a moving story about how difficult it was that time in those institutions, okay, I would be much more comfortable. But that was not the case. So I am raising my doubts as somebody who is a social scientist, who is not a specialist in this particular field, and who is able to mobilize certain personal experiences and certain experiences based on the sources which help not to be surprised by what was what was said. So it, I, I don't know what what I what I made wrong. Doesn't give you right to make unscientific unscientific arguments, and that's exactly what you are doing. You, know. I do you are, think you are that attacking, not you are attacking yeah. research on the basis of your personal experience from one case. Angela is asking what was that? <laughs> what, what, yes, it's, I think it's a proper question at this point. <laughs> what was the case? Angela is asking you what was the case. What was the case? I'm not understanding this. What was the case? The case was that I, I am, my suspicion is that we heard a moving stories about a group of people implicating or indicating uh, that uh, the situation was, I mean, you, you used adjectives as 
insufficient care, uh, not professional. But I was not sure how much it is related to what we obviously, spontaneously consider as sufficient and professional and blah 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 today, or how it was related to the historical context we are talking about. This is my doubt, and I am just saying about it. Ah, and, 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 and it seems to me that, that as that's, such your presentation uh, is misleading and is politically, uh, to say it, is politically unfortunate. You should, I think, Sorry. you should compare um, the care for children with disabilities with the care for children without disabilities. And for example, for people um, that have this um, in placement, also for children that were in place, there, for non-disabled children in Austria, they were in place into foster families, in a family care family, yeah. in educated, controlled families. Yes. For disabilities, it was institutions. You see the difference? Yes, but and, I, I and myself I made a difference when I was talking about the fact that while it was not perhaps completely normal to beat children uh, within part of raising children, but it was much more common and usual to, to do it to children who were difficult, who were disobedient, who were in, in one or other way uh, difficult to educate or, or to raise. It was much more, much more common and, 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 and it, is, it is completely... And was it good then? Yeah. Do you think it was good? I, I did not say a word about it. Sorry. As you said, it said, I think it was, it was one. Much more it was, common. It was, yes. it was a problem. And it is, I, that's the problem I'm tackling, I was tackling in this, or I was mentioning in this. It was a problem how we treated children with disabilities because of a disability in comparison to children without a disability. Yes, because it was no disability in the way we consider and disability. It was not and it was well. not normal for children to be in an institution for getting a school at the age of six. Yeah. I don't know what you have done. If you are a child with six years, you have to send it to an institution 40 kilometers away. This is and you only improper, can this is a completely Sunday improper question. Or, or, I mean, yes, this was sorry, a, that was but, but that only confirms my, my doubts. If, if you are trying to defend your position yeah. by asking me if, if I would say my child to such an institution, that's completely and, and this is not scientific. This is not scientific. Come and we are a little bit running out of time. So please, I think it's the uh, time for the maybe the last word, and if if you if you want to some somehow conclude the discussion, uh, so <laughs> I think a <laughs> little bit, uh, later, but definitely inspiring. So uh, yeah, that's the definitely definitely uh, time for you to to conclude it if you want to. Um. Yeah, I appreciate the controversial <laughs> as well as the interesting <laughs> uh, um, questions and also the remarks. And yes, I, I try to um, to present uh, as, as a narrative, a story that isn't told before. It, I must say it's different to the narratives and stories you hear normally, but because normally you hear the history, you hear the helpers history, you hear the development of the welfare state and the, the social developments, but you never hear about the byproducts, and that's violence in the institutions, but also violence else in the families, in work, in every in every institution. But you have to talk about this. And and I want to talk about violence for children in this uh, and adults with disabilities in this institution. That's all. Making a that these institutions were violent and they still have uh, risks of experience violence for those children and those adults with disabilities. That's all. So, thank you. Thank you very much.